This will be a, a quick run through the theology of the body. That was actually the original theme of the retreat that, that Al had suggested. I was going to talk about theology of the body, but and then look at deviations like the transgender thing, same-sex marriage, abortion, etc. But in my research, I just felt it was to land at one topic because this thing had just kind of exploded because it's really the past, the past five years. So in theology of the body, we have this thing called the law of the gift, and the law of the gift it is, uh, according to John Paul II, uh, that we become a self-gift to others, that in our essence as human creatures, we, we can give. And so we're made in the image and likeness of God, who himself is gift. He, the, the Father totally gives himself to the Son, the Son gives himself totally back to the Father, and the love between the two of them is the Holy Spirit. And uh, made in God's image and likeness, we have that law of the gift embedded within us. Uh, we are made to live not as isolated individuals, each seeking your own pleasure or advantage from the other. Rather, men and women are made to live in an intimate, personal community of self-giving, self-giving love that mirrors the inner life of the Trinity. So, John Paul II's insight when we say we're made in the image and likeness of God Someone like Aquinas would tell us that, that we, we have an intellect and we have a will. John Paul the Great also goes a bit further and says, we're made in the image and likeness of God as a communion of persons. That is, uh, we become a, a gift, a self-gift to each other. Original solitude is the fact that when Adam is created, he's alone. And he's, he recognizes himself to be unique in the universe. And that there's no other animal like him. <clears throat> and no one like him in creation. <clears throat> he recognizes there are no other persons in the world, no other soul body composites like himself. And so uh, the fact that there are animals, and we see Genesis chapter 2, that come to Adam, it helps Adam recognize that he's alone, and yet superior to them is by the fact that he names the animals. When God says that it's not good that man should be alone, he affirmed that being alone Man does not completely recognize his essence of who he is. He realizes it only by existing with someone else, and even more deeply and completely by existing for the other. And so when Adam then <clears throat> sees his bride, Eve, for the first time, uh, he says, At last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We have original unity. There's this original unity that exists between Adam and Eve. And then we John Paul II further analyzes that and says that the human person is not just a body, but we're body soul composites. And what that means is that our bodies are essential, they're part of who we are. When we die, our soul is separated from our bodies, but we're not truly who we are when we're separated from our bodies until the last day. We are guaranteed that we get our bodies back. And we'll have our bodies for all eternity. One way to kind of like, a Christian way perhaps, or a um, backdoor theological way to kind of say all this stuff about the transgender issue, or even if you will, tattoos. Um, when the kid says, hey, can I get a tattoo, tattoo father? And I'm like, um, I was at a youth retreat and I said, why do you act, answer this question for me? Um, at the resurrection of the last day, and you get our bodies back, we your body have our a tattoo on it. And that may, might help you think what God thinks about tattoos. No offense if you have them, just saying, like, what do you think? And so instead of answering that question, the young man was like, we get our bodies back? Like, he didn't know about the resurrection of the last day. And then he went to one of the young ladies out there, and she said, and she's like, oh, we get our bodies back? And they went back and they said, there were 20 kids there. And it was like they never made it to the last line of the creed. <laughs> it's like they didn't know about the resurrection. And the same thing, if I change my sex or get surgery and, and change my body in different ways, what body am I going to get back in the last day? What body will you have for all eternity? One that God gave you. Not that you gave yourself. And so John Paul II tells us that the body expresses the person, that our bodies express in some way who we are, because 
where soul body composites and that something of ourselves shines through. It makes visible what is invisible. It makes visible the spiritual dimension of the person, that our bodies have that power to express who we are to others, and that our bodies then, we can say, is a primordial sacrament, a sign that points to something that is true. And so, <clears throat> in the same vein, then, uh, the marital act is not merely a physical union, it's a deep spiritual union as well, a personal union, which the man and the woman give themselves to each other. Bodily union is meant to express a deeper spiritual union. The physical intimacy of a couple is meant to express an even more profound personal intimacy. However, if I don't think my body has meaning, then everything is just physical intimacy physical contact without intimacy, that my body doesn't express who I am, that I can throw my body away, that I can do something else with it, that it's not essential to who I am because, as Descartes says, I'm just a thinking thing, not an extended thing. But John Paul II reminds us that our bodies have a nuptial meaning to it, that our bodies have a spousal meaning to it, that our bodies are made then within our own flesh. They're made to be to be given away to another. He says our bodies have a nuptial character in the sense that they have the capacity, capacity to express love, that love in which the person becomes a gift and by means of this gift fulfills his meaning. By this gift, we can fulfill the meaning of our being and existence. We can give ourselves away to another, we fulfill the meaning of our being and existence through the spousal act, through the fact that our bodies are nuptial. So the body expresses the person, and the body has a nuptial or spousal meaning behind it. And original nakedness is that where Adam and Eve are naked but not ashamed. What does that mean? It means that they're completely transparent to the other that they, they are free to bear their souls completely to each other without fear of being used, without fear of being misunderstood, without fear of being let down. When you think of how beautiful that is, to completely be open and vulnerable to the other and to be accepted by the other completely, 100% on both sides, that's what original nakedness is. It's complete transparency. That's what we have to do in our prayer before God. That's the ideal relationship that we have. That was before the fall. That's what Adam and Eve possessed. Absolutely no selfishness, no taking from myself. It was complete given. Total purity of heart. That, uh, and when they saw each other, they approached each other with complete reverence for the gift of the other. <laughs> Hence, in that type of environment, a complete mutual love and responsibility personal depth and intimacy can flourish with the, with the af affirmation of the person. There is nothing but the acceptance of the gift that creates the union of persons. And then original shame is that which occurs after original sin. That is, this notion that I can be used. I can be used by the other for the other's pleasure. And none, none of us wants to be used. And that Hence, now we have the uh, in, intention of self-mastery. We need to master our relationships and grow, and grow in virtue. Love now is tainted by the selfish desire to use the other. No longer mastering their passions, men and women tend to approach each other with selfish and lustful hearts. That's why Adam and Eve instinctively conceal their sexuality from each other the moment to sin and lust enter their lives. They no longer have total trust that the others truly see what is best for them. Instinctively, they know that their beloved may use them. And hence, the introduction of sin into the world shatters the original unity of man and woman and hinders their personal intimacy. For now, the defense mechanism of shame enters into the relationship. John Paul II says, this shame took the place of the absolute trust connected with the previous state of original innocence in the mutual relationship between man and woman. <clears throat> and hence, our Christian life is, 
in some way through our baptism, through growing in virtue, through grace and the sacraments, to get back to that place of that Adam and Eve had, so to speak, in the Garden of Eden, of original solitude, unity, and nakedness, and transparency. With transparency is vulnerability. We can't be loved for who we are if we won't reveal ourselves. Unrevealed, we never experience intimacy. Unwilling to reveal ourselves, we remain always alone. We hide because we think people will love us less than if they truly know us. But the opposite is true in most cases. If we are willing to take the risk and reveal ourselves of who we are, we discover that most people are relieved to know that we are you. And so um, we're all in the same boat. And as one theology teacher said, uh, that which is most intimate and personal is also most universal. When I discuss my struggles and, and my internal contradiction with others, like in a small group or things like that, you realize, hey, that's my problem too. Okay, I'm just like that. And then we have a sense of being connected. We have a sense of opening up and being vulnerable. And again, um, in a beautiful kind of analogy, uh, at, a, at a pure heart session, one time we had uh, like a, the dating panel or something. And so there were um, so they kind of broke into two groups and had women in the audience, they had men on the panel, and they would ask them the men questions and stuff like that, and what do you think of perfect date is, whatever. And they did the same thing. Uh, guys would ask like three ladies on the panel and stuff like that, and the back and forth. And so one of the young men who was engaged to be married but commented that, and you know, he's like in his mid 20s and athletic and stuff like that, and he wouldn't want to kind of mess with him in an alley by himself. With you by yourself, and, but yet he said, um, his fiance Sheila, he said, only she could hurt me now. And when I know when he said that, he meant that my whole heart is in her hands. She can totally crush me if she wants to. And here's someone who you you wouldn't want to mess with physically, but yet he recognizes that he's completely vulnerable to her. And he has control of his heart. And, uh, and I understood him to have a deep, mature relationship with her, that they, 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 they can share on that depth and that level of vulnerability and intimacy. We'll kind of go through this a bit quickly. Uh, two sides of love, there's a subjective aspect of love and the objective aspect of love. Subjective, this is like we're talking about love, my own personal feelings, it's a psych psychological situation. It's the feelings I experience. Tend to be more spontaneous reactions, the sexual value based on, um, oh, that's funny, based on the sensual attraction to the other's body, that's what's in my mind. And emotional attraction to the other's masculinity or femininity. So, subject to things that I'm just kind of attracted to, things that are spontaneous, things that are kind of like fleeting. The objective aspect of love, it's an interpersonal fact. The relationship is based in reality, the relationship in reality is based on a virtuous friendship, the pursuit of the common good, the seeking the best for the other, total commitment and a sense of responsibility for the other. And so when I look at love, there's this kind of surface level that's here, but there's the deeper reality that exists. It's that deeper objective aspect of love that is going to hold the relationship together. Uh, if I just say on this side, um, and that's what my relationship is like, or my marriage is like, or whatever. That's not going to last. There's nothing permanent in that. And so that, <coughs> that ability to go deeper, to be that gift of self towards the other, is what can uh, establish what we say immature love versus mature love. John Paul II's second so Calvary T was love and responsibility. Again, this immature love is based on my feelings. It's sensual and emotional experiences, looking inward. At times, it causes anxiety. It's based on egoism, and selfishness. A mature love is what, based on the truth of the other person and my commitment to the other person, it looks outward, not at myself. It creates confidence and serenity. It's based on simpler, sober emotions. There's self-giving, altruism involved. 
and it's focused on integrating the sensual emotional experiences with the objective aspects of love. Again, the virtuous friendship, the self-giving, the commitment, and responsibility for the other. When I love the other, I feel responsible for the other. Okay, the new person. So personhood. Man realized that he, you see back in this this back in Genesis, is the only animal who is a person. Who, that is created, willed by God for itself, for its own sake. And here, Boitiba uh, has what's called a personalistic norm as the basis of his moral theology. A person is a kind of good which does not commit abuse and cannot be treated as an object of use and as such as the means to an end. And here, John Paul II is kind of borrowing a little bit from Kant, who is telling us that we can't, that persons are not our ends, they're not means to an end. If I use a person as a means to an end, I'm using them, I'm using them for pleasure, for my own side purposes. <clears throat> Hence, the person is a good toward which the only proper and adequate attitude is love. And we can say the word team an ethical norm, the only proper response to a person is love. Uh, we use things, but we love persons. And in the separate category, we can say, we adore God. Adore God, love persons, use things. Uh, so if I'm walking in, I'm in the world, I see uh, another person, a man or woman, uh, my own response, ethically speaking, is to love that person. Uh, my cat, not a person, might like cats or dogs, but you can't love them. We respect animals. The unborn baby, person, my own response is to love the unborn homeless person, homeless man, a person, I have to love the homeless man. And so when I say kind of person, it's my own response, properly speaking, to love them. Isn't it an issue we mess things up? Sometimes we adore persons, sometimes we use persons, sometimes we adore things, we make them idols. And we, 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 when we switch these categories around between God, persons, and things, and adoration, love, and use, uh, we get into trouble. <clears throat> Man possesses, we possesses reason, not first and foremost, so that he can calculate the maximum pleasure possible in his life, like utilitarianism, but above all, that so he can know the objective truth. That's why we have brains. Ground the principles possessing the absolute meaning, the norms of that truth, and in turn, live by them. I have reason, so I can know the truth. I can derive principles from that truth, and then I can live by it. That's what John Paul said in Moses. Then, he lives in a way worthy of who he is. He lives in an honorable way. John Paul said in Moses. Human morality cannot be based on utility alone, but must extend to honorableness. That is, using my reason to see what objective truth is, get principles from it, and then live by it. That's why we have truth, and that's the mission of truth and freedom. I'm free to live in the truth. Um, it, this goes into contraception a little bit, but it's all based on contraception. Well, the failure to admit abstinence. The essence of abstinence as a virtue is linked to the conviction that the love of man and woman loses nothing by temporarily relinquishing amorous lived experiences. On the contrary, it gains. The union of persons becomes more profound, grounded fundamentally in affirmation of the value of the person and not merely on sexual attachment. So the fact that married couples can have periods of absence, the love grows, and they can hear it. Think of St. Joseph and Lady, they've had marital intercourse, and yet they're the most beautiful couple in history, that you could still find ways of loving each other. <clears throat> this is the concept of justice with respect to the Creator. Marriage relations must be justified not only horizontally with respect to society for one's spouse, but even more so vertically, given justice to the creator. What does that mean? We all have rights talks all the time. Justice, to give each what is his due. 
Religion is under the virtue of justice, which is to give God what is his due. Question? Yeah, we talk about rights all the time. But what about God's rights? Does anyone talk about God's rights? Things that he needs? What's God's do? No one talks about that. It's always my body, my right, my this, my that. Oh, God's rights. You don't see him complaining. I'm complaining for it. <laughs> so what is this justice that's respect for the creator? What are God's rights? Oops. <clears throat> John Paul II would say that elementary justice towards God requires the understanding and rational acceptance of the order of nature, who is that one at the same time, recognition of the rights of the creator. He says, we can again intuit these sort of principles from nature, and that is a certain order to them. <clears throat> Man can understand the order of nature and form to it in his actions by freely choosing to respect, respect fully the goods of human existence. <clears throat> it is out of the question that a man and woman act justly with respect to God the Creator if their reciprocal conduct does not live up to the personalistic norm. The personalistic norm is that when I see a person, my only response is to love the other. And here, this is all kind of like. And the end of the theology of the body will come to the very beginning, I skip the whole bit, but right to the end of the contraception. I don't love the other if I'm using contraception because I'm using the other for pleasure. Once I separate, oh, babies and bonding, and then sex just becomes something for my pleasure, something that's physical, then it opens up the door to a whole wide range of things. This is an exact link from using contraception, to uh, the loss of dignity of women in the world, to the rise of things like pornography, same-sex marriage, and the transgender issue. Precisely because a woman, because a person, transcends the world of nature, a man and woman who have married relations fulfill their obligations to God the Creator only when they raise their relationship to the level of love, to the level of a truly personal unity. Love is not use. I must offer God all that is in me, my whole being, for he has the first claim on all men. The order of nature must be raised to the order of persons. So what's here in nature is elevated to the order of persons when it's in conformity with the personalistic norm, that is, loving the other. It's showing that with this person, I can, my only proper response is to love. Not to use and not to the Lord, only on the Lord God. <clears throat> virginity, okay, fine. Virginity and intactness. Virginity means untouched. In virginity, a person belongs only to oneself, to God. In marriage, the woman surrenders her virginity to her husband and ceases to be a virgin in a physical sense, while the man ceases to be a virgin by coming into possession of his wife. This is understood as a relationship rooted in reciprocal control of love. The action of the marital intercourse is taking of yours. With regard to God, man's relationship, its posture, must be one of surrender to God. As a creature, we surrender our virginity to God, the uncreated spouse. And here, this is like influenced by St. John of the Cross. So, this is kind of answered the question. Uh, well, sure, I, a woman, I can understand how women can kind of like be in a spouse relation with God, but how does a man do that? And the answer is because in the marital embrace is an act of surrender. As, as the woman surrenders to her husband, we as human creatures, and so sort of, um, feminine principle in relationship, surrender to God is a masculine, masculine principle in relationship. We surrender in the sense that our virginity to God, the human created spouse. And that's how the theology of the body, the body has a spousal meaning to it, both on a natural level, with one's physical spouse, but on a supernatural level, uh, to God. The human soul, which is betrothed to God, gives itself to Him alone, under the influence of grace. This is mystical to spiritual virginity, even if no one longer has physical virginity. This is not only possible, but essential for married men and women. For giving oneself to God in an act of love may be analogous 
to that which constitutes the essence of virginity. So again, one can give oneself to God in a totally controlling way. And then skip this. To give, they to give oneself to another person has profounder origins in the sexual instinct. So this need to give ourselves. And this is interesting. This is an interesting insight that John Paul II has. It is more profounder origins than the sexual instinct. And is connected above all with the spiritual nature of the human person. It is not sexuality which creates a man and a woman, the need to give himself to each other. But on the contrary, it is the need to give oneself latent in every human person which follows out in the conditions of existence in the body. And on the basis of the sexual urge, in physical and sexual union, in matrimony. And what John Paul II is saying, because we have this spiritual nature as human persons, uh, that outlet that we have. It's latent within us as human persons and it finds the opposite of the condition of the existence of the body to give ourselves totally. It is not sexuality that creates that. It is the need to give oneself to find this object in the condition of the existence of the body and the basis of the sexual urge. <clears throat> so he kind of would turn things around <clears throat> on his head, what the world would think. But the need for betrothed love, the need to give oneself to, to unite with another person, is deeper and connected with the spiritual existence of the person. So it's not just like, I'm a body, and my body has all these urges and things like that. It's rather because I'm a person, and I have a deeper spiritual existence within me. I need to recognize the spiritual within me. And when I do, I also recognize my relationship with God. And I acknowledge that God exists. That there's a creator of the universe at the same time, who's, uh, I have to intuit what are, why he made me, what are the principles of existence, what are those things I should be living by. Okay. And this is just kind of an end, fatherhood and motherhood. Fatherhood and motherhood are rooted in the air life. It is a new way of crystallizing a husband's love for a wife, and a wife's love for a husband. A man himself is a gift. A parenthood on his wife, on his motherhood on her, and she and fatherhood on him in a marital act. St. Joseph and Our Lady, they didn't have a marital act, but they were parents. God bestows paternity on St. Joseph directly, and she, God bestows maternity on Mary directly from him. In other relationships, the husband and the wife bestow maternity and fraternity on each other. Motherhood is bestowed by the father, by the husband. Father who is bestowed is the gift that the woman gives to, to her husband. We don't get it by ourselves. We can't get our own kids. Fraternity and maternity are deeper than biology and are spiritual in nature. Yes, we may get our children physically, but more so in the spirit, because the modern parents of God, the Father. And so we get, um, so these are kind of like basic concepts we find in the theology of the body, and all of us are called. Uh, well, most of us are called to a physical fatherhood and motherhood, but everyone is called to a spiritual fatherhood and motherhood. You have to beget your children physically, but also bestow a spiritual fraternity upon them. We talk about what happens both physically and spiritually with the absence of fathers in today's homily. That's okay. That's that. I know that was kind of fast and. Um, if you, but we have to stop without questions because it's 12 o'clock and we should go to the rosary. Uh, and so we'll break, have the rosary, and then have lunch when we come back, and then we'll have.